Good morning and welcome to our Full Sail University Hall of Fame presentation on the raising of an extraordinary plant. Please welcome to the stage our presenter, Sean McCabe, and let's give him a warm round of applause for taking his time. Thank you. Thank you. It's December 4th, 2014. Uh, I was two days into a three-week vacation. One of the many fantastic things about Insomniac is we closed the whole office for three weeks uh, during the holidays which is the least stressful time of my year. And about two days in, I was thinking a lot about my career and reflecting back on it. At the time, I'd made AAA games for about 13 years, and I knew that something wasn't right. Just whatever I was doing, um, I didn't have the same sense of passion and engagement anymore. And it was around this time that I found an article that talked about this guy. Um, that is the author Neil Stevenson, the acclaimed sci-fi author. And the article talked about, there it is. The art article talked about how he had joined a secretive startup called Magic Leap. <clears throat> this article was frustratingly scant on details, but I was able to glean three things. The first, they had raised a lot of money, um, $542 million, which was led by Google against, I think, at the time, was like a $2 billion valuation. So they were a unicorn. The second thing is that they were almost ridiculously secretive. Um, like that quote in there, the startup has been extremely tight-lipped on what its final product will be. Um, they were so cagey about sharing details that you almost couldn't get a sense of what it was. But there is one quote in here, which I'll read happily. A synthesized light field that falls upon the retina in the same way that light reflects from real objects in your environment. I remember seeing that and going, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Because I knew what it was. And I did because I've been thinking about this thing for my whole life. Um, augmented, or as I'll call it today, mixed reality. And here's how I can prove that I've been thinking about my whole life. This is my first recollection. Don't everybody thank me at once. Anybody should be at all. Damn. Do you all remember that? Now be careful, R2. You made a fair move. Screaming about it can't help you. It's not wise to upset a Wookiee. But sir, nobody worries about upsetting a droid. It's because a droid don't pull people's arms out of their sockets when they lose. Wookiees are known to do that. I see your point, sir. I suggest a new strategy, Art. Let the Wookiee win. That's right. I could have cut that a lot earlier, but I had to hear that line, because I love that line. <clears throat> Star Wars came out in May of 1977. Uh, I was born in July of 1977, and my parents took me, when I was about a month old, to see it in a theater, because that's apparently something parents did in the 70s. It was a weird time. And so I am not kidding, I am not overstating when I have been thinking about this idea for my entire life. And so what I want to share today is a journey for me that began with realizing a lifelong dream but that ultimately brought me to reimagine the way that I think about creativity. Because I love stories and I love telling stories, I'm gonna present this journey in five acts. I'm gonna talk about ideation, how we come up with ideas. I'm gonna talk about prototyping, the first thing that we built to prove the concept. I'm gonna talk about pitching. I'm gonna talk about production, which is lame. Production's lame. And then finally, I'm gonna talk about the future, where this technology is going. And I'm not going to share every point. I'm going to skip around a whole lot, because really what I want you to get are the high points of my journey. So we're going to start with the idea. Um, fast forward 18 months. So we're in 2016. We'd been talking to Magic Leap for a while. We'd gone down to their offices in Fort Lauderdale, seen the technology. It's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. 
that it works. <clears throat> and they wanted to do some products. Um, we were, might have been the first developer that they talked to, because we had been so early just being interested in the tech. And what they wanted were ideas. And so four of us got together, uh, Chief Creative Officer Chad Desern um, and two of our concept artists. And we just got together in a conference room to talk about like, what we were going to do. And Dave Gurton, who um, is part of the fabulous Creature Box uh, duo who created Ratchet and Clank and so many of our most beloved characters, he kind of like sits down in his chair, and he's, t he's tall and everything, and he, and he leans back, and he says, so what the fork can this thing actually do? <laughs> because, and I think the funny thing about this is, we love making IP. Um, this wasn't our first Brodia. We've made a lot of stuff, and this is just a handful of the IPs that we've developed over the years. And Dave has been involved in a lot of those. But I think in this context, there were some really specific challenges. The first was unclear capabilities. Um, at the time, Magic Leap didn't even really know what the device was going to be able to do, the final product. And I'll say, this is a ML1, which I know has its certain design aesthetic quirks. I actually think it's cool as heck. But it's a really, really slick device. The fact that something's that small, that it's tetherless, it's really remarkable. But at the time, that's what Magic Leap had. That monster is called WD3 or Working Device 3. And it was really just built so they could prove out all of their sensors and optics. And then somebody's like, hey, can we, it used to be mounted onto a bench, and somebody said, hey, can we make it mobile? And do it. And so you, what you end up with that, that thing is heavy. It pokes you in the head because there are like weird wires, and it's connected by some giant cables to an extremely powerful PC. And the thing that we knew is to get something that's small and sleek, mobile, you're going to have to like downgrade those capabilities and try to find a good meeting point for it. But we didn't know at the time. The second thing, and this one was really, really nasty. And I think that this is the point that Dave was getting to when he wanted to know what it could actually do. There's no product definition. And what I mean by that is, if you go and buy a console game, you kind of just understand what it is, because there have been thousands, tens of thousands of console games made over time. People understand what that product is. AR and mixed reality, no one, no one knows. There really was nothing. Even Magic Leap didn't have a good sense of like, what a great product was. Their uh, chief gaming, gaming wizard, Graham Devine, who is a creator of Seventh Guest and um, Eleventh Hour, is really honest about that. And I remember him sitting down and he said, yeah, you know, we don't know. We actually know more at this point about what you shouldn't do than what you should. But the biggest problem of them all was something that's built into Insomniac's DNA. So what I want to do is I want to introduce Insomniac games to you and see if you can tell why this would be so darn hard for us. Did you catch it? Did you see why this is going to be so hard? It's because we make big stuff. Spider-Man is enormous. Resistance was enormous. The Ratchet games are enormous. Everything that we make is big at Insomniac. I mean, even some of the smaller titles that we do are much, much, much bigger than anything that would run on mixed reality. 
And that's because what we focus on as AAA developers for consoles is immersion. It is our goal, whether you're experiencing it on a screen or in a VR headset, to take that player, to take the player and put them into the fantasy that we've created, to make them feel that way. Mixed reality is not about that at all. Mixed reality is about integration. It's about sparse content, taking a few small things and then moving, it, moving them into our world, and then having them interact into the world, which is a real challenge for people that are kind of programmed to think about doing big, big stuff. And so we talked about it a little bit, and what we did is we established a couple of ground rules. And what we were going to do, we were going to go home over the weekend and think about it based on these ground rules. The first thing was this idea of enhancing simple joys. There's a lot of fantastic stuff that happens in our lives, and a lot of it's just spontaneous and unexpected. And I mean, I'm thinking about things like if you see a beautiful flower somewhere and then take a photo of it, or you see a butterfly, there are all these amazing things that happen in our world that bring us joy. And so that's where we wanted to start with these experiences. Um, take something that's a, a simple joy and then make it a little bit more amazing. The second ground rule was this idea of building a deeper bond with virtual content. And we know, how many people here like love a video game character? Like love. Like I was so sad when Eris died, I'm still sad about it. Um, that stuff is really powerful and that's happening on a screen. And so what we thought to ourselves is, if this thing that we create is in the real world, could we build something deeper? Could we do something even, even more lasting, even more profound? So we took the weekend, and that was actually a pretty fun weekend. Um, my mom, of all people, was in town, and I remember talking to her about different ideas for it. <clears throat> and what came out of it were a bunch of ideas that we then pared down to six which I will only semi-show you right now. <laughs> um, the reason why I'm not showing all of these is we might make them someday. And one of them we are making, but um, they did pick two of them, and the one that we decided to do first is in the lower right-hand corner, and it's called Seedling. And what we did at that point is we created, you know, from those six base ideas, um, a three-slide presentation for it. And I want to go over the one for Seedling. The idea for Seedling came to me that weekend because earlier in the year, my, oh goodness, how old was she at the time? My seven, six or seven year old had convinced me at Home Depot to buy some morning glories. I am not a horticulturist, but I am a dad of an adorable little lady. And when she's asked me if I'm, of like, of course, I'm gonna learn everything about gardening now. And we went through the whole process together, and it was fun. One, I mean, one of the most enjoyable things was going out there every day. We'd both go out together to see what was happening, and you would see it come up, and then it grows more, and then it grows more, and it's going up the vine like morning glories do. The really amazing moment is we went out there together, and there were flowers. I didn't realize that plants just bloom overnight. I thought it was, I thought it was this kind of gradual thing that happens like the rest of the growth process, but it isn't. What was just this viney thing that you had been loving for a while suddenly became this really, really beautiful thing. And that was the simple joy that Seedling's based on. Seedling is about raising an extraordinary plant, taking a simple joy and making it extraordinary. So Magic Leap liked the ideas and that was really cool. We had like a great meeting with him. But the thing that they really wanted to see is we want you to make something. Um, we make some really nice decks, I should say. We also got some amazing concept artists, it's ridiculous. And I like to think that I'm pretty good at pitching them. But what they wanted to do is something that they could play on their platform. Again, no product definition. What's gonna work on here? We don't know. So they said to us, hey, you know, can you do a prototype? This is not unusual for us. Even at Insomniac, we generally have some kind of green light green light process. I feel like even like Ratchet and Clank games have them from time to time, even though they're practically pro forma at this point. And the wrinkle in this case was that their hardware couldn't leave the building. And when I'm talking about their hardware, I'm talking about that monstrosity that is the WD3. And the funny thing about WD3, I mentioned before that it wasn't, it wasn't designed to be a product. 
It was designed, or it wasn't even really designed to be a dev kit. Dev kit. It was designed to be something that could test all of the crazy technology that's in that. And for a couple of reasons, they were reticent to do it. The first one is that is not the first product you want to see from a company that's raised um, half a billion dollars. It's not. It looks ridiculous. And you might have seen later that there was a picture of some test device that they had, and they just got raked over the coals for it. So that made sense. But the second thing is that, thing, that beast there is so brittle. The number of times that we broke it working on it was crazy because, again, like, that's, not, that's not what it was built for. <clears throat> and so what Magically proposed is that, oh, we could develop the develop the prototype in virtual reality up at our office, and then come down for a week and then port it to WD3. Um, we discussed it internally, and we couldn't think of another viable option. I feel like none of us wanted to do it. None of us were like, yes, we have to go and spend a week in South Florida. It just wasn't. It, it wasn't a thing we wanted to do, but we really, really wanted to make it. And so I just kind of said, fork it. Let's go to Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Spring break. But before we could do anything, um, I had to do one of my favorite things. One of my favorite things to do on a project is to build a team. I absolutely freaking -lutely love it. So what I want to do right now is introduce you to our extraordinary Magic Leap team. Do we have music for this? This is a really funny choice. Um, it might surprise you to learn that I'm a big Dungeons & Dragons fan. I'm a little, a little bit nerdy. And so in introducing this team, I want you to think of them, that, think of them as a party of adventurers, because that's honestly like how I approach it. You need different people with different skills. So here they are. We have a wizard, a practitioner of the dark arts, able to conjure amazing things out of thin air. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Nathaniel Bell, creative director and 2004 computer animation graduate. Full sail! Yeah. That's what I want to hear. That's not going to be the last one either. Next. A cautious planner and master problem solver who executes with deadly precision. And that is Nina Fricker, who's a lead technical animator, computer animation 2000. This is going to be a trend. She is awesome. Uh, next, we have the Paladin, a veteran warrior, unstoppable in battle, but driven by virtue. And that is Joel Bartley, a lead gameplay programmer. I believe he went to the University of Maryland. Who cares? <laughs> After that, we have the Bard. The Bard is a joyous creator, quick with a smile, who delights in tantalizing an audience. Please welcome Ben Van Dyke and Principal Animator. I think he went to DigiPen. Boo. Look at that smile, though. And then we have a druid, a gentle wanderer who channels the power of the natural world. And that is Jamie McBenemy, lead audio designer. A sly trickster calculating the best angle and always searching for the next big score. James Burns, gameplay programmer, game development 2014. That's right. You'll see. There's a lot of full sale people on this team. And then finally, and this is mostly just because I wanted to get one of those pictures made. Um, a, con a conquering reaver, habitual cliff jumper who seeks the thrill of battle. That's me, Sean McCabe, uh, executive producer back then, now CTO, game development 2001. I know. Look at that picture. That is like the most honest picture of me that you've ever seen. So here's our team. Um, four, four of seven were full sale grads. All of these people volunteered to work on this. All of them were really, really excited to do it. Um, they're kind of like me. Um, Nathaniel, obviously, graduated a long time ago, Nina. The opportunity to work on something like this was really invigorating. With the team established, it was time to make that prototype. And I want to talk a little bit about what made a good prototype in this case. So any good prototype needs to sell the core of fantasy. And I'm not talking like a design prototype. I'm talking like something that people can play and understand it. Have to sell that core fantasy. Even if it's really small, people have to walk away understanding what this game is, which is really, really hard to do. But it is so vitally important. 
The second thing that was interesting, and this came out of the fact, again, the no product definition, I decided that it should have a beginning, middle, and end. And I guess what I, how I'd contrast that to some other you know, vertical slice or green light demos, sometimes we will just like take three minutes of gameplay and then let people play through it, and people can understand it, especially if it's a franchise. Um, if we're doing a green light for Ratchet and Clank, it doesn't need to do the whole thing because they can probably guess that there are going to be some cinematics in there, some like, semi-lewd jokes, there are going to be some crates, there are going to be bolts, guns, all those things. But in this particular case, we wanted it to feel like you're going to spend two minutes um, in what is one of the first mixed reality products in the world, and we want you to understand it. <clears throat> Um, the initial prototype took about three months. Remember, we were working in VR for that team. Um, the bulk of that time was spent developing the procedural growth system for the plant. Um, we wanted something that gave artists control. Um, as it happens, people have been studying, like most things in graphics, um, procedural growth since the 70s. There are these things called L systems that drive procedural growth. And they're really cool, and they do some amazing stuff. That's a neat looking plant. That's not what we wanted, we want this. It's about raising an extraordinary plant. And so we spent a tremendous amount of time making sure that the underlying growth system could be latched into and customized by um, artists, animators, sound designers. And it was really, really complicated. Um, I was in like countless meetings to talk about this thing, and I have a confession for everybody that I wanna make. I have no idea how it works. I just told everybody that the other day when I was going through this. I was like, I just need you to know that. Like, I have no idea. I would just nod in the back and go, all right, good job, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of three months, we had something pretty cool. And so what I want to show you right now is I want to show you that first prototype with the caveat that it's not going to be running in mixed reality. It's going to be in VR on a black background. But I think it'll still give you a sense of what like a good green light pitch could be in a whole new medium. That is a really gratuitous title sequence. Nathaniel liked making that. The opening was inspired by watching time-lapse videos of plants growing. There is something inherently magical about seeing the thing come up there. They don't grow straight up, they wiggle back and forth. They seem so much more alive than we'd ever imagined. We think of trees and plants as static, but there's a lot of motion, it just takes time for it to happen. For this demo, we did something really, really strange and counterintuitive, and that is by cutting parts of the tree, it causes other parts of the tree to grow. Um, the same thing's true of the grass at the bottom. Snipping leaves has a different effect than snipping branches, but eventually if you get the right combination, you get that spontaneous moment of joy where this alien flower grows. And I remember one of the most interesting things about watching people play this demo was the fact that they all approached it differently. We would see people that were more calculating, that would wait for the whole thing to grow and then snip. We had people that would dive in. We had people that would go in, they'd do something, they'd cut the base and then start the whole thing over. It was really interesting like how this demo revealed aspects of our personality. I also think that this taught us a lot about how to make it feel really gratifying to grow, to snip something. Snipping is an inherent negative act. It's subtractive, but we wanted it to feel satisfying, and I think that we did that through just fantastic sound design. Jamie, you did an exceptional job creating music and sound effects that would make it rewarding, and this is the end. It ends at night. That is a pretty nice looking plant, isn't it? Oh, thank, thank you. So we had the demo in hand on VR, and so we went down to Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, it's spring break. I know. I just can't even sell that line at all. Um, and we were there for about a week, and it was a frickin' blast. Um, we were pitching on Friday um, to the senior leadership, senior executive team in the afternoon. But man, we had absolutely nothing to do but work when we were there. 
And we did. We would get to the office at 8.30 in the morning and not leave until 11 at night. And somehow, it was awesome. It, I have not have had that much fun working so hard since, you know, like early in my career. Um, and it was the same thing for all of us. Like these, I mean, we were veteran people with, you know, like seven children between, seven or nine children between this team. Um, there was one time when, when our Uber driver, our Uber driver <laughs> didn't read the room and, and actually did offer to take us down to the beach. He's like, you're going back to the Sheridan? No, you have to go down to the beach. And I was like, we're game developers, bro. Like, it's just not, not, not our scene. We're very lame people. <laughs> and I want to say Magic Leap's offices are so, so, so cool. And I hope that you get an opportunity to go there someday. Um, you never know who you'll run into. Uh, one small story, I was, walking, I, was, I was walking around doing something, getting a soda or something like that, and I walked by the fishbowl where their CEO, Roni Abovitz, sits. And it's a fishbowl, so you can see all around it. And I was looking at that, I was like, I, that dude looks really familiar. And so I kind of like did an angle, and I looked around, and was Steven Spielberg is in there. <laughs> People are excited about this technology from all over the world. Um, and so you see some really interesting people when you're in there. It's like, it's, it is hard not to get starstruck when you're at Magic Leap's offices. But of course, I can't show you anything, remember? They're extremely secretive. I have two photos, though, that I smuggled out. They weren't really smuggled. These are actually approved by Magic Leap to share. Uh, so this is the first one. That's Nina and Nate and Joel working, working at our desk. It's cool. Don't you guys all want to go there? I know. It's pretty amazing. It's tr truly where Magic Steven Spielberg is blurred out. No, I don't know. Uh, and then the, se the, second thing, the second thing has to do with my role at the time. Um, so I was there on site, and I was doing some meetings, but I didn't make anything in this demo. I wrote the thing, and I you know, review, reviewed thing, and then gave feedback on it, but I, I wasn't doing stuff there. And I'm an antsy person, so I wanted to find stuff to do. And the thing that I didn't want to do was let my anxiety about the clock ticking um, get into the team's head. I wanted them to be able to focus on their work and not worry about, like, you know, Sean freaking out. And so what I used to do, what I learned to do is I would take a walk over to their kitchen and get some wasabi peas because they have the best wasabi peas I think I've ever had in my life at Magic Leap. I spent a lot of time going over there. So it was around 1.30 a.m. on Thursday. We had gotten the demo running on WD3 and we had it set up in their demo room. Their demo rooms are really, really interesting. They look like little Ikea mini apartments which seems very bizarre that they have two or three of them in their office. seems really weird, except when you think about what they're building. Um, ML1 is all about using it in your home or in your office, and so the best way to demo that is to have it. It actually had like a little kitchen. It had a small bedroom in there, weird cactus. I feel like it had a guitar, but the amp didn't work, which is a drag. <laughs> drag for me. And so, and I had done a run through of my presentation, and we felt really, really good about it. It's 1.30 a.m. We're like, okay, let's get out of here, world. Um, and our producer came in, and he has this tick where he'll come in and he'll go, <clears throat> and he clears his throat, and it's like his signal that he's going to just tell you something that you don't want to hear right now. And what he told me is he's like, I have great news, guys. Everybody wants to see it at Magic Leap. Literally everybody wanted to see it. Um, they had tons and tons of people. Makes a lot of sense. They had been working and thinking about this stuff for, you know, it could even be decades. I'm pretty sure Roni Abovitz, their CEO, has been thinking about mixed reality longer than I have. And so they wanted to see something actually running on it, um, which was really exciting for us until he said, yeah, you, we just have to be ready to go at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Oh, my goodness. Um, it was late, and I was really grouchy. And I think they had brought us beer at some point. Beer and wasabi peas is what got me through that. And so, um, and so I, I just said to him, um, if you get me another beer, I'll pitch this motherfucker right here, right now. Confidence. <clears throat> and there's a lot that can be say, said about pitching. And it's a big part of my job, something I've done a lot. And they actually had a fantastic panel, I think yesterday, um, about pitching from some of the other grads. And so I'm not going to get into like Sean McCabe's like 13 rules for pitching. I totally have them, and I actually was going to put this in, but I took it out because I thought it was a little bit superfluous. <clears throat> but there is one thing that I do want to talk about, and that is the importance of belief, which I think is the foundation to pitching anything. Um, there's this thing that people say that you invest in people, not ideas. And the proof of that is, if, imagine you're an early, an early stage investor, 
Do you know how many startups have one idea to do something really amazing and then end up with something completely different? It happens all the time. Um, just because you start in one space doesn't mean that you go, that you're going to end up there. And so really what it comes down to is the underlying people. And the big differentiating factor is looking for people that so strongly believe in their idea that they literally couldn't imagine living without making it. It's belief, it's love, it's emotion, it's investment. Um, Sam Altman, who's the CEO of Y Combinator, which is a, the, the preeminent tech in incubator in Silicon Valley, um, wrote that he looks for in people folks who have even too much self-belief. And I think that this one is important, which is why I want to impart it. Um, you have to have too much belief that when people say that you're crazy, you have to have too much belief to ever give up on something. That's what people look for. But I think another important thing is investors have belief too. This is Roni Abovitz, the CEO, founder and CEO of Magic Leap. <clears throat> By any reasonable definition, he is crazy. And the reason why I'll say that about him is Roni lives in like 2035. He lives in, he lives in the future where this technology is ubiquitous and everybody has it and everything's connected and you can do all these extraordinary things with it. I have never met somebody that can paint a more compelling vision of the future than Roni. But it's crazy. You just get swept up on it because it's so exciting. He so believes in this stuff. The interesting thing about Roni, this isn't his first startup. Um, he got his start um, building in surgical robotics with a company called Mako that I think was sold in the 2000s. And I can almost guarantee that when he was pitching the idea of robotic surgery, people thought that was crazy too. But I can imagine him being able to go in and just saying, yes, this is a future, and it is today. Um, Mako is a pioneer in this space, and a lot of people are getting some really important care as a result. <clears throat> so when you're in a room with someone who's like that, I'll just say, it's not time to question yourself. Or be too nuanced. Be confident, and if you need to, be a little bit crazy. And with that, I'm going to talk about production. Nobody wants to talk about production, am I right? I'm going to tell exactly one story from production. But where I'll start is nice, noise. Magic Leap loved the demo, absolutely loved it. I did, I feel like I did 14 like half an hour pitch meetings. The last one was with Roni and their uh, CFO. And after going through that marathon and everything, we built a lot of excitement, they greenlit it. And for our scrappy party of adventurers, like this was like Nirvana. And it's funny because this is like the smallest game that we've ever made, but for some reason we just felt like the coolest people in the world, like we're awesome. The budget in this game is tiny in comparison, I should mention, to the other stuff that we made. But it felt like we had really done something and it re resonated with the uh, team at Magic Leap. <clears throat> and we met on Monday um, after the Friday pitches back when we were in the office and we basically spent a few minutes you know, basking in our collective badassery because that's what you do. And then there was a really quiet moment in the conversation. And it might have been just for a few seconds, but I feel like it was forever. And it was Nathaniel who broke the silence. Um, he took a deep breath, he's a soft-spoken guy, and he said, oh no, we actually have to make something now. I totally didn't bleep that out, I'm sorry. He said I could curse once. <laughs> I will say, almost every project has prescribed freakout moments. They are like clockwork. It is like Groundhog Day for me sometimes, because you just see them it's at these specific points. Pixar has their freakout moment, which we have as well. When you say to yourself, it's usually like two-thirds of the way through production, you say to yourself, we have just successfully spent tens of millions of dollars, tens of millions of other people's dollars building the biggest piece of crap that the world has ever seen. Like That is a complete thing that happens. There's also one that happens when you go from your really exciting making a tiny prototype thing to production, when you have to scale that product, and it's a pain. And it is really demoralizing. Remember, a lot of what I talked about is the excitement that we had. It was just demoralizing to reach a peak and then realize you only have a taller mountain to climb. Which gets to my story. Um, 
this is a t production's a talk into itself, so I'm not going to really talk about it anymore. I'm just going to say like one critical moment where I learned something interesting. 50-part lecture series on production sounds fascinating. Um, and this is actually this was actually a turning point for me. Um, we were a few months and still didn't feel like we'd hit a groove. What I would say is we felt like we were making stuff, but we weren't making something amazing. And it's frustrating um, because we've made a lot of games together before, a lot of great successful games. But for some reason, we couldn't get the magic back that we originally happened. And I think the biggest problem that we were running into was UX. Um, again, there's no blueprint for it. Trying to get people to interact with things in mixed reality is really, really hard. Um, you know, the finger tracking has a lot of latency to it. There's no haptic feedback. It's just hard to like, communicate these really basic things, and we were struggling with it. And so there's a certain point where I was like, okay, I'm gonna like, call a friend and just vent about this and see if she has any ideas. So I called her, um, that is Margaret Haig, who is tonight being inducted into the Hall of Fame, which is amazing. Congratulations to Margaret. Uh, Margaret is a UX designer and one of the most honest human beings that I know. Her picture isn't up there, is it? I misread my slides. That like totally represents our two personalities. And so I called her. Oh, actually the thing I need to say about this, she said that she was going to be here today. I said, I want to put in a story about when we talked on the phone. She said, yeah, I'll totally be here today. And then like last week she said, no, I can't. Why? Because I'm getting my hair done. Now, I want you to know, normally that would be unforgivable for me. Unforgivable, but I think we can all agree. She's got some amazing hair. <laughs> really does. Um, so she's a designer at Capital One and has worked on products that have reached tens of millions of people. She's really, really good. She has a good ex intuitive sense, like great um, user empathy. And so I called her and I laid out the problem we were facing. And in the process of explaining, which is probably my thing, I clearly had gone deep down a rabbit hole, combining graphic design, historicity, and human cognition. I know, exactly. And I remember like saying all this stuff to her, and at the end of it, she was just completely silent. And so I ended this whole word salad that I'd thrown out there by saying, oh yeah, Margaret, what would you do? You're like really good with this stuff, what would you do? <laughs> And what she said to me, she paused for a few seconds, and she said um, something that she kind of says, she's like, I don't know, I mean, I don't know. Um, and then she said, just try some stuff. Nobody knows what they're doing. What are you afraid of? Ah. Even when I look at that now and I think about that moment, I'm like, damn lady, thank you. I got off the phone and I was stuck on this question. And I think that we were afraid because we were veteran game developers. We know stuff, I get paid to know stuff. I know all kinds of stuff. And when we transitioned to production, our expectation was gonna be like just adding water. Oh man, that is not an intentional pun, but it is the right analogy. We thought that we had this kernel, we'll just add water, expand our production lanes, make a lot of stuff, make multiple trees. Everything's gonna be awesome. And it just wasn't like that because we're supposed to know stuff. And what was interesting, all of the fun that we had had with Mag Magic Leap, which hopefully is coming across in what I'm telling you, was about not knowing stuff. No product de definition, no hard requirements, nobody knows anything about it. That's what made it interesting because we were using those parts of our brains. It wasn't about just going into the toolbox. It was about like constant problem solving. <clears throat> so at any rate, this was an epiphany for me and I want to share this idea that I was just thinking there is a joy in not knowing. There's a joy in not knowing. Perhaps a lot of you experience that because you don't know a lot of stuff now. But it is, easily, it is easy over the course of a long career to lose sight of that. After 18 years, um, really easy for me to say to myself, like, yeah, not knowing is uncomfortable. Um, so I called the team meeting, I got everybody together, and I just said, you know, the fun part of this project is the not knowing. Not knowing if things are gonna work, we need to get back to that. Um, just roll up our sleeves and solve some freaking problems. And I could see the people in the room. They saw the same thing, they're like, oh my God. It is totally true. Um, we ended up making a lot of changes. This was an inflection point in the project. We ended up changing the theme to go with something that's more sci-fi. Um, we did a lot of stuff and we changed a lot of things up at that point. And it did prove a boost to momentum. 
that uh, got production in high, in high gear. Um, there are other moments in production uh, over the course of the next several months. There was a launch and all these things. But what I do want to do finally is show you a picture of the finished product. This is composited. <laughs> that is an extraordinary plant in our world. And let me tell you, when you experience it, your brain is telling you that that thing is real. Something magical. Then finally, the future. Um, I'm going to fast forward to October of last year. Um, we'd finished, finished the game and had the honor of being the first non-internal app on the ML store. Uh, it was a very dubious honor because it basically meant everything was broken. But we got it up there. That was our whole goal. We, the, there was no point in us doing this unless we were going to be first. And it, and it ended up working out. We did it. Um, the team had shifted on to other products and experiences. There was one day where I came in the morning, Nathaniel came by, um, and he says to me, we've got to talk. And I've got to say, I've been in leadership for 12 years. It's never something I want to hear. Ever. Um, so we went to my office, and we sat down, and Nate was kind of looking off into space and looking contemplative. And I just said to him, the normal thing, I'll start a one-on-one. -on -one, so what's on your mind? What's going on? And I'm really just hoping he said, I have to quit. I have to leave. No, it wasn't. He looked at me deadly serious. And he said, it's not about the fork and glass. I had no response to that. This is such a strange moment in my life. So I just kind of did like a what, what? And he said it again. He goes, it's not, about, it's not about the fork and glass. It's way, way bigger than that. <clears throat> and what he meant, which is how we get to the future, is from the beginning of this whole thing, it was the glass that got us excited. It's stuff like this, these optical tests. Um, I have some terminology written down here that I can't remember. But from the beginning, you get transfixed by these optical systems. And I also have to say that, like, oh, here we are. We have terms like photonic chips, holographic processing, digital waveguides. That stuff is really alluring. Um, the fact that you could embed a series of invisible transparent mirrors that reflect light directly into your retina and somehow convince you that objects are at depth, that doesn't make any sense. It is really alluring. And I got to say, Magic Leap's, look, look, Magic Leap's all about it, too, because you look at the pictures of Roni, what is he holding up there? He's holding up the glass. The glass is cool. But Nate was right, because it's a lot bigger than the glass. So to explain this, I want to show you an image that from Mag Magic Leap. This is this thing called the Magic Verse. And the first time I heard them talk about it, I said, that is insane. I have no idea what they're talking about. So I'm going to try to, I don't want you to try to parse that image because it's impossible. It is, beyond, it is beyond human cognition to understand what's in that image. Except to say, the dream of mixed reality is about tapping into the real world and understanding it and using it as anchor points that you can then introduce virtual content. And I guess what I mean by that is we have this physical space. So you could scan this physical space. So you, have, you have spatial information. You have location-based information. Maybe all of your cell phones are telling you where you are. So you have information about people. Um, if you imagine layers, layers of reality that are built up, what you end up with is something akin to a customized and personalized and enriched interconnected world. And you know what? You can look at it with the glass, and you can see it there, but you can also look at it with a handset. Maybe your watch would interact with it. Maybe there's a virtual object here that buzzes when you get close to it. Maybe it could be home appliances, home smart appliances. Maybe it could be cars. So in truth, the thing that will make this special in the future goes a lot farther than the glass. The glass is just a window. Maybe it's the best way of experiencing it, but it's just a window into this broader, extremely complex, um, world that we'll all be surrounded by. It's basically this. This is the Oasis. It's a place where the limits of reality are your own imagination. Anything. Go anywhere. 
like the vacation planet. Surf a 50-foot monster wave in Hawaii. You can ski down the pyramids. You can climb Mount Everest with Batman. <laughs> Check out this place. It's a casino the size of a planet. You can lose your money there. You can get married. You can get divorced. You can, you can go in there. People come to the Oasis for all the things they can do. But they stay because of all the things they can be. I couldn't think of a better picture of what this could look like um, than that scene, that first introduction. But just imagine the kind of complexity it would take to do that. Um, just that scene from Ready Player One. You kind of get a sense of what that magic verse is, of layering all these things on top of each other. That's a fully immersive experience. At the other end, you have something that's more integrative. But there's this whole range of things that you can do in the middle. <clears throat> But even if we had a smaller, cheaper, and more powerful mixed reality device, which we'll have, we'll have in a few years, um, it's not going to come close to providing the back end that actually needs to make all this happen. Um, what's it going to take? And it's a lot. And I had a whole thing where I was going to talk about how the internet sucks at, sucks at real time and edge computing and what technologies might change that. And I'm not going to talk about it right now. But if somebody wants to ask me later, I can opine on the whole thing. But the real thing that it comes down to is the future of the mixed, a future of mixed reality isn't just about holographic chess and the Millennium Falcon. It's about fundamentally re reimagining the way that we interact with the world, tapping into massive amounts of computing power that exists in data centers, streaming that to these very small, cheap, affordable devices. And with all that, I want to go back to Neil Stevenson. Um, who's familiar with Neil? You should be. It's great. Um, the thing that I've always loved about Neil Stevenson's work is that it's not just about the tech. There's a lot of really interesting tech in there, but it's really about people. It's about the way tech affects people. And it can be really, really dark. Um, you see things like gross income inequality, distrust in social in institutions, and I do think that there is a recalibrated sense, a recalibrant, recalibrated sense of what is actually shocking. And for all of these like gaps, these eroded gaps, you have technology that fills it in imperfectly. <clears throat> and to me, I see a lot of that stuff now in our world. And one, one of the things that I think about, maybe because I'm 41, or maybe because I have kids, or maybe because the future matters to me, is dystopia inevitable? Is this our future? And if it isn't, what can we actually do, the people here as creators, to help? So the last thing I'd like to leave you with is where this journey ended for me. And I'm actually going to pitch a very small product to you that I think could be interesting. <clears throat> I think that this whole question for us as creators is answering um, the nature of our creations. And I think we need to ask ourselves, are the things that we create just tools? Do we just make stuff and give it to people and then move on to something else? There isn't an expression, um, guns don't pil kill people, people kill people. I have absolutely no rational way to argue against that. It's a frickin' fact. But there's something about it that's always like hasn't quite sat well with me. But you know what really doesn't sit well with me? This. When tech executives are saying the same freaking thing. It's just a platform. Social media doesn't kill, kill people. People kill people. It's a certain point when I, I and uh, hopefully it's obvious where this complete abdication of responsibility is BS. Where is it? It's over here. BS to me. I do call BS on this stuff. Um, as creators, we aspire to impact the, the lives of our users. That's why we do it. It is. And if we're lucky, we might be able to reach hundreds of thousands, millions, even billions of people. And this is where I end up. Creation is responsibility. This was the big thing that I learned going through this whole process with Magic Leap. We have a tremendous responsibility to our users. And so what, in, what, what if instead of ignoring that responsibility, just creating tools and letting people just sort out the way they wanted, what if we lean into the responsibility? What if we embrace it? Could a new kind of creativity emerge? 
something that's more conscientious. It seeks to engage still the full range of human emotion and experience, while also thinking about the underlying impact and the opportunity that comes out of it. What might we create then? Well, you're in luck, because I'm going to tell you. <laughs> this is an idea that I've been mulling over uh, recently. Um, I'm a runner, and so a lot of the time when I go on long runs, there's a certain point where I'm like, wow, this crazy thing would be really, really cool to make. Um, it's something that builds on everything that I've shared today, and I hope it stands as the example of the kinds of things we can do when we embrace this responsibility. It's something I'm calling augmented empathy. So for background, empathy is, on, is in decline right now which is insane. Um, there are a lot of theories of why they think it might be incorporating more data-driven decision-making. They might be our modes of communication cut out empathy, which they do. Face-to-face -face conversations are really profound. Once you get down to, I don't know, likes, it, you're losing a lot of the content. I mean, you're just objectively losing a lot of the content. But people today demonstrate less empathy than they did decades ago which is scary for us because we are in the emotion-engaging business. Empathy is vital for creators. If you make stuff, you need to care about users. You need to understand and get into their emotional space. I, again, it is. It's all about moving emotion, what we do. But one of the really amazing things about empathy is that you can actually train it. So all hope is not lost just because we are. There, are, there, there have been studies on things that have trained people to better recognize emotions and then act on them, um, which is wonderful. That is really, really powerful, the ability to change behavior. It's what makes our brain so cool. And so what I want to propose is, this is the idea I'm imagining, let's say that there's a socially acceptable wearable device that, if not cheap, is similarly priced to, uh, similarly affordable to a smartphone. And that is... That is taken from a presentation Mike Abrash, who's chief scientist at Facebook Reality, Reality Lab, said. That, that was his example of a socially accepted one, and he had the caveat, we're not making this. Don't think we're making this. I'm just using it because it looks really cool. It looks socially acceptable. So this device is actually pretty dumb, and that's what allows it to be socially acceptable. It doesn't have like a lot of underlying hardware um, outside of a lot of the sensor processing. What it does, though, is it wirelessly interacts in real time with massive computing resources on the cloud with low latency. So it is effectively streaming apps. So this device, the, the device streams video and audio to this crazy, from, from, from it to this crazy um, powerful backend, and then analyzes that information and then reports back the results. This might involve identifying microexpressions, which, are, which play a vitally important role in revealing um, some subconscious emotions. Um, there's a really famous study, contempt you'll see that in there. There was a study they did where they took couples, married couples, and they had them just talk to each other. They filmed them and then cut up the film to get all of their microexpressions, these things that laugh for half a second or something. What they found is if you find contempt in there, there's a 70% chance of that relationship failing. That is powerful. It might also identify body language. Body language is a really, really, really big deal. And it tells a lot about how someone's feeling. Again, that's what we're trying to get. Um, it might transcribe what a person's saying and run it through a natural language processor, getting to the bottom of what somebody is actually saying. So many of the, th so there is a lot of, uh, been a big move toward like literalism, where you just accept what people say. It's a thing that comes out of digital communication because you have no idea what people actually mean. You say it in your own internal voice and you make a guess and then you get pissed off and then, then Twitter is a thing. So what if we could surface some of those things earlier? Um, it might analyze public profiles to try to contextualize people's communication. We do a lot of communication through these things and there's information to be gleaned there. So imagine it has all this stuff. Oops, wrong way. So given all this information I've talked about, what it could do at that point is offer advice, like a coach, on how to have more empathic communication. And because I'm a game developer, it might also be really cool to offer rewards for successfully applying it, gamifying empathy. Trying to use those drivers that we know in the products that we create to do something like that. 
Bringing empathy back. Sounds like a pretty amazing thing to do, doesn't it? Could you imagine being able to do something like that? Getting some small fraction of the population to re-engaging with one of the fundamental things that makes us human? When I think about that opportunity, I get really excited. Um, I've had some absolutely amazing experiences over the last 18 years. Um, I absolutely love what I do, but the one that I've shared today was probably the most profound. Um, and I want to say, making things, being a creator, is not a job for me. It's me. My identity, it isn't tied to the work. It's tar tied to the act of creation. That is so important to me. And so when I tell you that I have reimagined creativity for myself, what I'm really talking about is I changed as a person. This experience changed my life. This idea that we can embrace the responsibility of creation, um, it's showed me a way forward in my career. And I gotta say, I'm excited for the next 18 years and beyond. Um, tell amazing stories, solve challenging problems, create groundbreaking products, but most importantly, find the opportunity to make better people. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions?